This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 77, recorded on April 29th. 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how are you doing, Vincent? I'm well. How are you? Very good. Very good. Uh, happy, birthday. Well. happy birthday. Happy oh, birthday. Thank you. Thank Should you. I sing a song? It's, it's my no. album birthday. <laughs> hey! Please, please. <laughs> how do you it's know I'm album- like... I'm not uh, Luciano Pavarotti. You You're not. Well, here I thought. Why not, Michelle? <laughs> You're right, I'm not. But I'm not good at anything. Okay. Oh, yeah, right, right. Well, <laughs> so joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, that voice who was questioning my singing ability, <laughs> Michelle Swanson. Hello. <laughs> it's graduation season here in uh, Big Ten land. When is graduation? Next week? Uh, on on Saturday. So does the town go crazy for for gen- graduation? Well, um, a lot of parents come into town. Wow! But in the meantime, of course, the students um, are holed up in libraries, getting ready for final exams. You know, elsewhere on campus, like my daughter is a um, at the law school here, and mm. she and friends have been just camped out at the law library. She graduating? No, she's a two L. Wow. Well, I'm sure that's crazy for a tiny town like Ann Arbor to uh, absorb all those parents. <laughs> well, Here in New York stadium, City. They have the stadium for it. That's right. <laughs> they sure do. Here in New York City, we don't even notice graduation. We have multiple universities, as you know. Right. But this, of course, is the center of the world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to see if anyone argues with <laughs> Okay. No, well. no one's going to argue with you, Vincent. <laughs> also joining us today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello. Are you in the center of the world there? Uh, if you've met the original Charlestonians, the answer is yes. You know, we're one of the original three. It was Boston, New York, and then Charleston were the big three cities hmm. uh, at the time that our nation was formed, James Sound sort of fell into the river. Now we're going to get mail from Virginia, but <laughs> that's okay. We but, like, to but um, you know, it's it's interesting. But we we had the recent unpleasantness, which uh, suppressed our ability to grow like Boston and New York. Mm. What was that? The recent unpleasantness, mm. and that would be the war of northern aggression. Hey. Oh. I'm not sure it was northern aggression. Well, that's the way we refer to it here. Actually, the Civil War, since we're having the anniversary, um, actually started uh, in what is now our university chapel. Mm-hmm. It was the, a stable, and um, the captain of the garrison cabled President Lincoln and told him he was getting harassed by the local militia. So President Lincoln ordered him to decamp from the Porter uh, stables and to move to Fort Sumter. And every school hmm. child knows the the story of the Civil War with the shot being fired at Fort Sumter yep. from the battery in Charleston. How far is Charleston from Raleigh, Durham, that area? Uh, it's about four hours. Four hours. Well, I'm, I might be down there this summer. Maybe I'll pop in and say hi. That'd be good. you. All right, we have two papers for your listening pleasure today. And uh, Ailey, would you like to do that first one or your paper first? Oh, sure, sure, why not? In fact, I, I have to start out with a little um, relating my experience of the last half an hour. I had read this paper and the title of the paper is quite complicated. Phytoplasma effector SAP54 hijacks plant reproduction by degrading MADS box proteins and promotes insect colonization in a RAD23 dependent manner. If you swallowed all that, you got the point of the paper. The authors are McLean, Orlovsky's, Kovid Vachnik, Jarska, Angenent, Imink, 
in Hogenhout, wow. and they are from various places in England and in Holland. Now, what happened to me was kind of funny. Uh, as I've been working on this for a while, and I was reading assiduously about on, on this on this matter, so I googled the, um, the subject, and out popped. This is a half an hour ago. I popped a very similar paper by a Japanese group. And I sort of have to, I'm going to recognize this, this oddity that when that this happens at this kind of a speed, uh, you got uh, you got a problem. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I did not have enough time to tell you uh, what the, the, this paper? This paper seems to the second paper seems to be saying something rather similar to the first paper. The authors there are twelve authors, so I will name all of them. The first one is Maejima, and the last one is uh, Namba. The title of this paper is "The Cognition of Floral Homeotic MADS Domain Trans- Transcription Factors by Phytoplasmal Effector Phylogen." induces phylo D. I have to explain all those terms. Okay, so anyhow, I apologize to the authors of the second paper because in a half an hour, honestly, I could not chew the paper, you know, digest the paper rather. I could chew it, but not digest it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to go with the original intent, which is to talk about the British and the Dutch paper. That okay? Yeah. What's the timing right. on the publication? Were they both within the same? Uh, let's see. Both are uh, 2014. Uh, gosh, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, within weeks. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the, the paper we're discussing uh, today is April 2014 in PLOS Biology. Yeah. Gosh, where is the other one? I'll, 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 it's I'll look it's for April. It. it was published April, April 8th. Yeah. So oh. you, you've you only looked at this. You haven't had a long time to study this. and I have not had a long time to study and this. And it's, right. it's, it's a really hot topic. Um, That's I right. Was, You're right. I was flying on a plane last week and reading this paper, and in the back of the airline seat was The Economist magazine that actually had a vignette on this particular paper. Wow. No I, I, I was I was oh. shocked. Here cool. I am reading – this plus one paper that's complicated <laughs> and the economist is talking about this. It was, it's absolutely well, fascinating. So Elio, go. Ha- yeah. Well, it happens that <laughs> the subject of plant pathogens is far more developed than I had an idea. I, I did not know how well studied this is and phytoplasma. And I'll tell you, I'll talk about phytoplasma in just a minute and you can help me, Michael, uh, are a big, big subject because they cause all kinds of diseases. The diseases are called witch's broom and the, what, what, what all are they called? They, they, they cause virescence, which is making flowers green. They cause a thing called phyllody, which has, is part of this paper, and that is converting flowers into petals into leaves, essentially, or having come out as leaves instead of um, flowers. But before I do that, let me tell you that the whole subject can be uh, subsumed into a general topic of behavior modification by parasites by pathogenic agents. Because here, the agent is making the plant act differently. You could say it is changing its behavior. And uh, as the authors point out in their introduction, this is a widespread phenomenon that has a, I would say, a medium level of attention. I'm glad to hear that the Economist magazine thought this was worth talking about because, in fact, it really is. Now, can I start out by giving a few examples of behavior modification by parasites? Sure. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, we love it. <laughs> I, I would object if you didn't. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, well, the granddaddy example of all is toxoplasma. That is a parasite, a protozoan that affects a lot of mammals, including humans, and causes serious diseases, including uh, congenital malformations, so that 
pregnant women are told to stay away from cat litter, which is where you can find the cysts of this guy. Now, the interesting thing about toxoplasma is that it has a dead-end lifestyle in humans and in rats, and it needs the cat to finish its life cycle. Okay, so from the point of view of the toxoplasma, infecting a human or infecting a rat is a dead end. Okay, but, and this is the big but, toxoplasma makes rats act differently. Because obviously, from a toxoplasma point of view, a rat being eaten by a cat is very good for business. Mm -hmm. It ensures that the life cycle will be complete. So guess what toxoplasma induces in rats? It induces the loss of the fear of cats so that all of a sudden they become much cat easier to catch. in particular. <laughs> cat, cat urine in particular. Cat urine. Yeah. So they, um, the rats do not run away when they see a cat. The cat gets them, eats them, gets the toxoplasma in it, and now the toxoplasma is in happy land. That is the granddaddy example of host modification or parasitic manipulation as it's known. And there are many other examples. And some have to do with what insects, certain insects do when they are affected by fungi or viruses or some parasites. They climb to the top of a stalk and wait there to be eaten by a herbivore and this spreads them around. It spreads around the I'm sorry, this is due to classically to fungi, and this then spreads the spores of the fungi around. This is called summit disease. And there are other examples. Now, my favorite example is one that I hope Vincent will have something to say about, and that is the common cold. Mm. Common cold, when I have a common cold, my wife thinks that I am totally impossible. I want <laughs> to bed, I don't want to, impossible -er. <laughs> more so than usual. <laughs> I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to just lie in my bed, maybe read a book, but stay away from people, okay? Now, other people claim the same thing. And it's kind of specific for the cold because when I'm sick with something else, I don't quite act like such a brute. <laughs> I'm, I'm much more personable. So I have a feeling that this is a human reaction induced by the virus in a way that is meant to avoid the transmission of the virus to other human beings. We don't want to have anything to do with other human beings, but less likely to transmit it. What do you think of the theory, Vincent? Oh, great virologist. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> uh, well, these, these infections are spread very effectively, common colds, influenza, other respiratory infections. So... If there is an effect of behavior, I think it's minimal because we have problems stemming uh, transmission, oh. you know, so I, I don't think it's likely to modify. Oh, you know, shots. the problem here is we have to tell people, look, when you are sick, don't go to work, but they go anyway right. because they don't yes, want to right. miss work. I think an interesting viral behavior modification is rabies, which makes animals crazy and aggressive. Right. And so they bite other animals and transmit so it, right? Much better example. Anyhow, it's to some extent that there is no infectious disease of humans that doesn't have a behavioral component. I'm quite sure of that. So this object here is the changes in the behavior of plants due to infection by phytoplasma. Now, not everybody is going to be totally familiar with phytoplasma. So again, another digression. Here I go again. I have to tell you something about phytoplasma. Uh, phytoplasma are essentially plant mycoplasma. They are part of that group of organisms that, that have no cell wall. And uh, see, they ought to be the weakling of the microbial world, but they're very good at what they do. They're good at survival and causing disease. And in the plant world, phytoplasma cause a whole lot of diseases. They have various names like uh, witch's broom of, of various, uh, various plants. And they're, they're widespread and they are of great economic significance. So uh, uh, ask the yellow which is bloom is one we're going to talk about here, but they, they cause many other diseases. So um, I 
don't know that phytoplasma are front center in the microbial in the world of microbiologists, but they ought to be. Uh, Michael, you probably know much more about it than I do. You want to add something to the phytoplasma story? Well, they're they're in the molecules, which are these. Um, I remember hearing my first seminar on them as as graduate students because I thought the name was so interesting, and. Um, you know, it, it really is like mycoplasma for plants. And instead of, you know, infecting the blood system of the organism, they affect the phloem. And, you know, I think they've been engineered to Say spread. Phloem. Phloem. And they're, they're engineered to spread via insects, you know, the sap-sucking insects. Mm. And... Uh, you know, if you think about the plants that they attack, I mean, the economics is incredible. Everything from sugarcane yeah, to coconut to saddlewood. I mean, it's it's really pretty interesting of how they go about doing this. But, you know, as, as we get into the molecular biology, I want everyone to think about these bacteria that can modify behavior and modify genes that actually have an effect. I'm going to put the question out there for you all to just ponder as you're listening to the story on Merge. Is this an incidence of a punctuated evolution where the bacteria can come in and cause a trait that may have a consequence on it, on the organism, mm -hmm. the plant or the mammal have a consequence on its ability, its development. We know toxoplasma actually results in profound birth defects in, in humans when a pregnant female uh, gets it. So are there microbes out there that can do what we're about to hear that are responsible for these rapid burst of evolutionary wonder that we sometimes see in the fossil record. Well, Just take us through it because I think okay. it's a comparison I thought of as I was reading it and yeah, was just you're fascinated. Right. Oh, you're right. Okay, so anyhow, uh, first of all, I should add to, to the, I, um, the picture of the phytoplasmas is that they cannot be cultivated. And of course, they have no genetics. They cannot spread by themselves. All of them are insect, uh, spread by, the, by, by insect, by biting insects. Not biting people, biting plants. Now, uh, the story is the following. Uh, phytoplasma, in some of the plants they attack, the, the, the problem that they have is that the insect may not necessarily want to go to the plant and bite it. So it has, the phytoplasma has a evolved a mechanism for making it agreeable for the insect. And the insects are all kinds of uh, sap sucking insects. Uh, there's all, all kinds of uh, leaf hoppers and uh, uh, psyllids and insects like that. Anyhow, all relatively broad host range. Anyhow, what happens is if a plant gets infected with a, a phytoplasma, instead of making flowers, it makes leaves. Now, why is that good for business for the phytoplasma? And the reason is that insects don't, unless they are pollinating insects, don't have much use for the flowers. Flowers don't have a lot of sap, but leaves do. So having more leaves instead of petals, is a way to attract insects to the plant. Okay? So, this, how is this done? Then? How is this done? Well, there is a virulence factor, a protein, which is made by the phytoplasma, which is called in this paper SAP54. And in the paper, which I'm not going to describe, is called uh, FIL1. I think it's the same protein best I can tell. So anyhow, this protein is injected somehow through the salivary glands of the insects. The phytoplasma reach the sap and, and uh, multiply there. And they um, do the following. They interact with a series of transcription factors. Now, transcription factors are key proteins in uh, protein synthesis and certainly in development because they uh, can determine what 
uh, kind of genes are turned on and what kind of genes are not. This is a group called MTF. And their MTF stands for the M is MADS Domain and T is transcription and F is factor. So MADS Domain Transcription Factor, M-A-T-F. Okay. The effector from the bacterium, SAP54, binds to some, but not all, of these transcription factors. And by the way, the transcription factors are found also in the insect, some of the same. However, although they are highly conserved, there is one, these turn out to be modular proteins with four domains, and one of the domains, which is um, uh, keratin-like, is typical of plants and not of insects. Sounds funny that the keratin should not be typical. Of, well, I don't think insects have keratin. And it's not real keratin, it's something like it. Anyhow, this is a transcription factor which is found in plants and not in the insects. And the bacterial protein binds to them and ensures their destruction. And how do they get destroyed? Well, they get destroyed because this bacterial protein essentially recruits another protein, which is a shuttle protein called RAD23. I'm really sorry, listeners, that I'm showering you with abbreviations of names of proteins. There are three proteins that matter here. One is the bacterial protein, and then two uh, sets of uh, uh, plant proteins, one the um, the transcription factor, and the other one a shuttle. A shuttle to what? A shuttle to the apparatus which destroys protein, namely ubiquitin, the ubiquitin proteasome system. So uh, proteins get destroyed by that system. Ubiqu the uh, proteins get ubiquitin, which is a small molecule bound to them. This is recognized by the an organ called the proteasome, and thereby destroy. So the bacterial effector binds to two kinds of proteins, the specialized transcription factors and the shuttle protein that gets to the that get, brings the transcription factors to their doom and destruction. <laughs> now the interesting thing about this is that when this happens, when the plant is infected with this um, organism, some of the transcription factors that get destroyed have to do with making flowers. So all of a sudden, it cannot make flowers anymore. Instead of making flowers, it makes leaves. Mm -hmm. The leaves look a little bit like a flower, but they're green, they're not petals, and so forth. So now we, here we have it then, that the phytoplasma induces the formation of these leaves. Phylloidy is the name of the phenomenon. And they're little okay. clusters of leaves. So they're shaped like flowers, but mm -hmm. they're That's leaves. That's right. Yeah, That's so they, right. That's so, right. which is important for attracting the insect, apparently. That's can right. only do so much with this one batch of proteins. It really <laughs> can't change the way the flowers look, but it says we'll make them a leaf. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. So this is interesting from a point of view of plant development as well, and we learn something every moment we read something new like this. Now, the interesting thing is, so sure enough, then, they have infected plants or transgenic plants that do a lot of experiments here, um, the, tr in, uh, the plants which are infected are much more attractive to the insects, about 10 times more than normal plants. So there you have it. Now, in the process, the plants, of course, lose their ability to reproduce via seeds. They don't make flowers, they don't make seeds. They become zombies. <laughs> they be, you know, they just, that's what the authors call it. They become zombies. And this is the story. Now, I got to tell the listeners that the story is considerably, it has been studied in considerable detail. And what I said here is really in a very abbreviated, somewhat superficial account of what's going on. Uh, read on if you want to, but for, the, for our purposes, this is the story. The bacteria carried by an insect to the plants, they induce a morphological change, which gets the insects excited and therefore trans transfer and transmit the, uh, the bug much more often to other plants. So, why, so why does it be having a green leaf get the insect more excited than a flower. Personally, I'm more excited by a flower. No, I know. Well, <laughs> you don't eat sap. Or pollen. 
Yeah. These insects don't don't have a use for pollen, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so they like sap. In a, a flower is the wrong place. Mm. There's no not much sap in the flower, but if you convert a flower into a leaf, that's what the sap is. It's amazing that infection can do that. It's a reprogramming it of development, really. It is. It's, it is. it's absolutely incredible, and and you have to ask, you know, a, as plants develop a defense against this, because the plant when, is mm. in the witch's broom case. It's very isolated just to that flower, and it effectively spreads it out. So has the plant adapted to this insect and says, okay, I'm going to sacrifice this category of a flower for this? And does the plant – and is the plant still able to to reproduce? Uh, because obviously that would be a dead end for the plant. So does every flower on the plant get converted to a leaf? I don't think so. Uh, well, I think what happens not, is it, it's with just the other flowers. Because <laughs> yeah. then it would be a dead end, right? It would be sure. a dead end and evolutionarily selected against, which is also mm-hmm. why, you know, you think about dose and how much of these transcription factors the microbe is making, and they're obviously not able the to move. Is uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, you, you get confused because of this damn shuttle protein. I, I, I commend Alio for tackling this. This this had um, a substantial amount of of really cool molecular biology in it with the transcription factors. And if you're a fan of two hybrid technology, I I commend you to to going through the figures and looking at how they use two hybrid technology, which fuses proteins together, and then it looks for interactions and a reporter molecule to allow you to see what's actually going on. And that was um, developed by Stan Fields, who at the time was at uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook. And he's since taken this out to uh, great lengths. And it's really revolutionized uh, transcription factor biology to to illustrate how things can interact with one another. And without two hybrid, we wouldn't know how these bacterial proteins are interacting with uh, plant transcription factors. So, if you, if you have an opportunity, take a take a good look at uh, in, in Figure Two um, and Figure Three of of this particular uh, paper because it's it's really uh, pretty cool showing you actually what's going on. So, Elio, they do they do this work with Arabidopsis, but I presume the yes. phytoplasma sorry, say that. the phytoplasma also affects some oh, some plants that are that, and everything else. So it can, a lot of, a lot of plants, and so it's economically important. Oh, very much so. Mm. Very so. Yeah. so, in addition to the two hybrid assay that leads them into the molecular biology, there are also just some beautiful classic phenotypic assays, which, of course, are important for any genetic screen. So, the the other images that readers will see are these lovely photographs of the healthy plants, which have white flowers, mm. and then the infected plants, which have green leaves. It's a just a super easy elegant assay and then the other one that i thought was is easy to work with yeah the other assay that i thought was very cool was what they called their leaf hopper choice assay Mm -hmm. so imagine they have um flats of wild type plants and mutant plants and they just let loose i imagine leaf hoppers let them make their choice and then to learn to count which plants were favored by the insects they counted um larvae that, that mm. would have been left behind once the insect eggs hatched. So I just thought that was a, a very cool assay to go in and count, and then, aha, here's the smoking gun. This is the plant that was preferred, mm. and this is the plant yeah. that was yep. ignored. I think we have an economic opportunity here. We can take roses and make the petals into leaves, and they would look so <laughs> cool. <laughs> Green roses. Uh, you, I think the I think the rose industry will put out a hit on you, Vincent. They make too much money on Valentine's Day. Plus, they wouldn't yeah. smell good. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Dumb idea. But they would look great. <laughs> see, they would look cool. A, a see, rose is a rose is a microbe. <laughs> see, you see, Michelle, I'm not good at everything. You know, I you noticed. Can't be good at everything. I noticed that uh, part of the funding comes from the Gatsby Charitable Foundation. I wonder if that has anything to do with... Well, Gatsby was a fictional character, right? 
Yes. Yeah, Fitz, yeah, yeah, of course, Fitzgerald, right? Yeah, but maybe they named it after the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> I have no idea. The Gatsby Foundation. Cool paper, Elio. It is cool. Well, good. I, I thought he'd like it. It's just, I tell you, it's a window into a different world. I mean, I don't think most of us deal a lot with plant microbiology and pathogenesis. And uh, I admit readily, I was not aware of how sophisticated the subject has gotten to be. Vincent, have you ever done a toxoplasmosis story on TWIP? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that a couple. They're very popular. People, listeners love this story. Yeah. Oh yes, the Gatsby Foundation is a British foundation. One of their objectives is to support research in plant science. It's just well, I'm glad somebody's doing that. I have to say, Elio, there is an example in the virus world that's very similar. There is a virus uh, that is transmitted to plants by aphids. When the aphid bites the plant, it transmits the virus. Then the virus replication causes the plant to emit organic molecules that attract more aphids. Oh, yeah. And the aphids come and they bite, but they don't like the taste of the plant because that's also been modified by virus infection. So they quickly leave and go find another plant and they spread the infection. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That is. So I, I think that probably behavior modification is going to be more common than we think by the by pathogens. Yeah, I think so. By the way, I didn't say, but also phytoplasma induced that too. They put out an attractant called beta caryophylline which is an amazing compound. It's a sesky terpene. It's what gives the flavor to black pepper, and it's a cannabinoid. Hmm. And it's, it can be bought, it can be purchased as a dietary supplement because it's anti-inflammatory. <laughs> wow. It's wow. a molecule. Anyhow. All right. Thank you, Elio. Of course. Our next paper is called Bacteria Activate Sensory Neurons That Modulate Pain and Inflammation. The authors are Chu, Heisters, Gassem Lu, Von Han, Zhao, Tran, Wenger, Strominger, Mural Diharan, Horswill, Wardenberg, Huang, Carroll, and Wolf. And the authors from Harvard Medical School, University of Utrecht, yep. University of Iowa, and Korea University. And Chicago. That's right. University. University of Chicago. The big city. Boy, it's another great example of this new trend, the new world of multi-authors, multi-institutions. The staff community really does a lot of collaborative research. I, I, I've met a number of these individuals um, at the International Staphylococcal Meeting, and they're always kibitzing amongst themselves trying to figure out the tricks that this remarkable bug, Staph aureus, can actually accomplish. So this paper was actually suggested by Bernadita, our, our listener, and we read her paper last time. And uh, so thank you for that. It's really a neat paper. This paper is about pain. Now, typically we think after infection, the inflammation that the pathogen induces is what causes pain. And inflammation, as everyone knows, is rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor, right? That's Red, pretty good. Remember that, Elio? A four card yeah, signs. Yeah. yeah. Way back to the Roman physicians. What right. was his name? Galen. Galen. You know, heat, swelling, pain, and... Redness. Redness. That's what you get when you hit over par, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a spy. Pain. Pain. I, had a, I had a spy yesterday. I was talking to one of um, Michelle's colleagues, and <laughs> all her claims about golf are true. Can't be, good, can't be good at everything? Is that what you're saying? No. All her claims about golf are true. So she says she's really good. Is that right? And she's really good. Um, you've impressed many people, Michelle. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Name names. <laughs> <laughs> Name names. <laughs> this, is some, this is someone I've played with? Oh, yes. Yes. He was okay. in a scramble with you. It, it's Vince Young. Oh, right. Nice. We find out things every week. 
Anyway, so it's been thought that inflammation, you know, all this, these changes that occur as the immune response kicks in and, and cells are recruited to the infected area, there's, there's a permeability of capillaries, all this to try and get the infection cleared. It's always thought that this causes the pain, but they show otherwise here, and it's gorgeous. So the model they use is Staphylococcus aureus, which is known to cause very painful wound and surgical infections. And they inject the vi- the uh, the virus, the bacteria, into the hind paw of the mouse, and they measure how this affects uh, the sensitivity to pain. It's called hyperalgesia. If it makes the mice more sensitive to pain, and they use uh, different ways of measuring. They use touch, where they have these. Um, these fibers that they put on the hind paw, and they can measure basically how often the, the mouse pulls its foot away from whatever is uh, is being applied, either the touch, cold, or heat. And they, they measure how many more times the mouse is, is picking up its foot if you put it on a hot or a cold surface. So it's, it's behavioral observations on the mice coupled with, as you'll see, very nice molecular biology. So when you inject... You could say- so you could say this is behavior modification also. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is these two papers are, are actually very similar in their themes. You're absolutely right. You put staph aureus in the hind paw, they get hyperalgesia, increased sensitivity to pain. So first they look at this and they ask, what does it correlate with? Does it in, correlate with the influx of immune cells? Does it correlate with the pro-inflammatory cytokines? These are cytokines produced by cells, which lead to the swelling and the and the redness, etc. They don't. The hyperalgesia does not correlate uh, with these, but rather, hyperalgesia mirrors the time course of bacterial expansion. So they measure bacterial numbers, and that is what correlates with pain. Then next they say, is it important to for the, the mouse to sense the presence of the bacterial infection? So molecules like toll-like receptors and the signaling proteins that are involved, uh, they use mice that are genetically ablated for these genes. They specifically look at toll-like receptor 2 and MyD88, which is a, a signaling protein involved in toll-like receptor pathways. And in fact... You, the, the mice still are hypersensitive to mechanical and thermal uh, 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 hyperalgesia, basically. So sensing the bacteria doesn't matter. They then remove neutrophils and monocytes from the mice uh, with antibody, and the pain goes up because they think that these mice have more bacteria now because you're removing these important cells. But if you take away the adaptive immune system, you can remove NK cells, T cells, and B cells genetically. There's no, uh, there's no uh, increase uh, other than uh, the, the numbers of bacteria leading to the pain sensation. So innate and adaptive immune responses are not needed for the pain associated with this Staph aureus infection. Uh, in Boy, mice. I would not have guessed that. Would no, you? I wouldn't have at all. Absolutely and, and, not. Yeah, they didn't expect that either. But right. So they expected that's that, why you do the experiment. That they expected <laughs> that one of these would have uh, knocked it out, basically, right? Yeah. yeah. So next, they want to know what is it that's causing the pain. I think what I think is amazing is that you can. When I first read the title, I said, "How can you measure pain in a mouse? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't talk to it, right?" <laughs> But obviously, you can do things that are very sensitive. And the yeah, they dig- have they have the mouse standing on a grid, right? Like a wire grid, and then you just come up from the bottom and touch it. And if if it's a big, thick probe, it may not hurt the mouse, and so that mouse doesn't yeah. respond. But a sharper point would cause it to yeah. lift up his it's, paw. It's, very, it's really cool. I would too. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all would. All right. And- so. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know if this will hold, but we've all experienced a pimple at least once in our lives. And you often. I never had any pimples. You you (laughs) often feel the sensation of the pain associated with the pimple before the abscess even forms. And oftentimes when you're talking to medical students or dental students about pain, uh, and and Staph aureus is, is one of these phenomenal microbes that is forms abscesses 
And so if it's based on the concentration of the number of organisms and before all the neutrophils come in and it fills with pus and all of the other things, you you may actually – because I think we all have a, a, a memory of sensing that a pimple is coming on and it, it may be the pain that we're beginning to detect as the numbers uh-huh. are building. Hmm. I, I, I don't know, but I – I certainly can anticipate when, you know, you're you're feeling a, a localized abscess forming, and you look and there's nothing there, and then the next morning, boom, it's there. Report. All right. So what is causing the pain? So next, they do a series of experiments where they remove sensory neurons from mice. So you can do that by dissecting out the dorsal root ganglia, the co- the collection of the cell bodies which are outside of the central nervous system. You can put these in culture, and you can measure the response, okay? And so an important control here is they can take these cultured neurons, and they add capsaicin or capsaicin. Capsaicin is the active component of chili peppers. It, what, it is the stuff that makes your mouth burn when you have a, a really hot chili pepper. And we know that capsaicin hits sensory neurons and initiates uh, voltage fluxes. So they measure that. They actually measure calcium flux, which is a a measure of the permeabilization of the neuronal membrane, and action potentials, voltage is induced, and they show capsaicin does that, as you would expect. But then if they take heat-killed Staph aureus and add it to these neuronal cultures, they also induce calcium flux and and an action potential. So somehow these killed bacteria are stimulating the sensory neurons, and it's the same ones that would respond to a pain inducer like capsaicin. So that's a suggestion that this is involved, this, these are what's sensing uh, and, and initiating pain. And they, they find the same with staph pneumonia, strep pneumonia, uh, listeria, mycoplasma, helicobacter, pseudomonas, E. coli. They all do this. They all, they all induce uh, activity in these neuronal cultures. Okay, so now we move back into mice. So now we have to define what is a nociceptor, because this is they've used this word throughout this paper. A nociceptor is a receptor on a sensory neuron that is what is believed to respond to potentially damaging stimuli like capsaicin by sending signals to the central nervous system. You may want to spell nociceptor for our readers. Nociceptor, N-O-C-I-C-E-P-T-O-R. Thank you. So when you eat pepper and you have pain, this feeling of pain, it's because the nociceptors on your sensory neuron are sensing the capsaicin. So they actually do a really clever experiment where they have a promoter Uh, a promoter sequence of of DNA, which is specific for cells that have this receptor, and they can use it to drive the production of a red fluorescent protein, tomato fluorescent protein. So now they can mark these nociceptor-containing neurons with a red fluorescent protein, and they can show that when you add these heat-killed bacteria, the neuronal responses, the, the calcium flux and the action potentials are being evoked in the red population, All right, So this is the same population of neurons that is sensing pain. And by the way, if you put heat-killed bacteria into mice, into the foot pad of the mice, uh, they also have increased pain, hyperalgesia. So they always, they always do these nice connections between in vitro and in, in vivo. Okay. So what is it in the heat-killed bacteria that is activating these pain receptors? They checked peptidoglycans, no. Lipotechoic acid, no. And then they checked N-formulated peptides. These are previously known to be recognized uh, by receptors on the surfaces of leukocytes. And this, in, 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 during infection, this causes chemotaxis. They're known to be recognized by olfactory receptors. So there's some uh, reason to believe that there might be neuronals receptor. receptors. You want to mention how they're formed? And Why don't you say that? Because you probably know a lot better than I do. Well, in bacterial protein synthesis, you make an extra piece of, an extra peptide mm. in, in terminus, and that gets formulated and then gets chopped off. Right. And those peptides are unique 
uniquely bacterial. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. We don't make them. That's correct. So, it's, so that's because the the end formal methionine that initiates synthesis is it's formulated, right? Right. right. Which makes them a great uh, clue to the immune system that there's been a contamination and an infection. Right. And so the neutrophils right. will go screaming toward that. Um, it's what uh, Lewis Thomas would have called a visiting card. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, card. So these are sensed specifically by these receptors on leukocytes, for example, as being foreign, right? Yeah. So they take uh, a couple of these from E. coli and Staph aureus, they add them to their neuronal cultures. They induce calcium flux in the same neurons that respond to capsaicin. You put them in mice, these formulated peptides, they cause hyperalgesia. They are receptors for these peptides that are known to be uh, present in mice, as I've mentioned. They find these receptors uh, on dorsal root ganglia cells. And they can knock out the receptors in mice. They take dorsal root ganglia from those knockout mice. And when you add the formulated peptides, they have less calcium flux. And if you give the peptides to the genetically altered mice, there's less pain. So apparently these formal peptides are contributing to uh, pain sensation in mice. All right, so that's part of the story. So N-formulated peptides seem to be part of the signal that, that Staph aureus is, is providing to cause pain. They also found that if you culture Staph aureus, you just take the supernatant, you add that to dorsal root ganglia neurons and culture, that will induce calcium flux. And they trace this to uh, a protein called alpha-HL, hemolysin, right? Alpha-hemolysin, is that... I think that's mm-hmm. what that stands for. Right. Secreted by Staph aureus strains, which plays a role in pathogenesis, tissue damage, inflammation, and so forth. If you add alpha HL to DRG neurons, purified protein, it induces calcium flux. And the way this works is it binds to the, to a couple of other proteins on the neuronal surface. They're called dis- A and disintegrin and ADAM10. They form a pore. And so the idea is they form a pore, and that's what gives you the calcium flux. And this purified alpha HL, if you add it, if you inject it into the mouse foot pad, it induces hyperalgesia to mechanical heat cold stimulation, although it is heat labile. So this is a distinct component from the heat stable component that is uh, also causing pain. They can make altered alpha HL proteins with cha- amino acid changes in them. Uh, that prevent them from causing pores. And if you add those to dorsal root ganglia cultures, they do not cause calcium flux. They don't cause action potential. If you put them in mice, they don't cause pain. So base, and also, this is a neat one. You can make a mutant of Staph aureus devoid of the alpha HL gene. This causes much less pain uh, in the mouse. So uh, another so is, molecule- it, is it additive, the inform, the uh, formal methionine peptides mm. and the hemolysin, are they additive or are they... That's a they good work? question. I don't, I don't remember. Really that. Just, yeah, I don't remember seeing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That that would be a good thing to do, right? Because they're talking about different degrees of, of hyperalgesia in these experiments. You know, it's not, it's not an all or none, right? Right. They can also, the other th- experiment they did, which is pretty neat, they can ablate these nociceptors, uh, their genes in mice, using a Cree diphtheria toxin system. Basically, you can induce the production of diphtheria toxin, specifically in uh, cells that are producing the nociceptor. And th- when you do that, the mice no longer respond to mechanical or thermal hyper uh, sensitivity. Beautiful experiment. Really nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they notice that these mice, when you infect them, they do have increased tissue swelling in the area of the foot. And this is caused, as they show, by infiltration of neutrophils in monocytes. So if you take away the pain receptors, you get increased local inflammation. Well, and, you still should, yeah, why not, you know? But it's more than, it's more than the Uh wild-type mice. So pulling out the nociceptors, you get more inflammation than in... I wonder why that is. Is And the lymph nodes are bigger. The lymph nodes are bigger. There's more TNF. Why why is that? Well, that's part of the story. We're going to resolve that in a moment. Can you you wait? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and also the higher levels of, of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a cytokine that is, is partly what makes lymph nodes swell, lymphadenopathy. Okay. So then the final question is, this is, so this is, a, in their view, a form of immunomodulation. You take away the pain receptors, you now get uh, uncontrolled I- inflammation. So with the pain receptors present, the bacteria are engaging them and somehow immunomodulating. So what's doing that? So they look at the expression of neuropeptides in these cultured neuronal cultures and also the expression of the receptors for these neuropeptides on immune cells from these animals. And they find a couple of uh, neuropeptides whose, uh, whose levels are quite high in, in immune cells, in particular calcitonin gene-related peptide, galanin, somatostatin uh, are, are highly induced, and their receptors are present in the immune cells. Okay, so the nociceptor neurons produce these neuropeptides, and then the neutrophils and the monocytes and macrophages have receptors for those neuropeptides. And in vitro, if you add these neuropeptides to macrophages and you stimulate them with heat-killed bacteria to produce TNF-alpha, the neuropeptides suppress the production of TNF-alpha, okay? The supernatant by itself of a staph aureus culture causes the release of these neuropeptides from neurons. And if you inject some of these neuropeptides into mice that have been infected with staph aureus, you suppress the swelling of lymph nodes. Mm. So the idea mm. is bacteria mm. infect, they produce components like um, the, the formal peptides in the alpha HL that bind to re- pain receptors on neurons. You feel pain, but at the same time, the neurons release immunomodulatory peptides that suppress inflammation so you don't clear the infection. So pain may be really just a side effect of the bacteria trying to immunomodulate um, so that they can stick around longer. Wow, this is fabulous! Isn't that cool? Was this known before? That, that absolutely mm-hmm. not, as far as I can tell. This is this is more important than anything else in this paper. <laughs> it is, and in the one question I had is, would this have been better if rather than making pain, it made the animal itch, because you could have dug the focus infection out by <laughs> scratching. <laughs> But that would just probably lead to the spread of more bacteria. So that, those animals probably were selected again. So pain's probably the the best best thing that staff could have done. Plus, it's not just staff. They showed that this is true oh, yeah. of what yeah, killed absolutely. E. coli, listeria. So no matter where you are in the body, you can trigger this pain response or the immunosuppression, more importantly. That's why I brought up pimples because they're mostly, you know, propionobacterium acne or one of its friends. So the way I view it is the bacteria are, the, the goal is not to induce pain, but rather to engage the sensory neurons so they produce immunomodulators. And pain is a side effect. Locally. Yeah. yeah. So, and they, they mentioned in the discussion that this certainly isn't the whole story. There are probably lots of other inducers of pain. You know, this is a reductionist system uh-huh. that they're looking at. And there are going to be a lot of others that may be virulence factors as well. But this is really uh, groundbreaking and really nice story. And it's wow. so cool to see the, the mechanistic connections between our um, neurons and our immune system. Yes. So that, you know, that connection we've known about for a number of years now, it's quite clear that... Uh, that our immune system is innervated, but to see these kinds of functional interactions is really nice. Yeah. Right. So I had a chance to talk to the first author um, today, Isaac, Mm -hmm. and uh, what a, what a great conversation we had. Um, Let me tell you, he uh, got his start in biology early. Uh, He was inspired by a high school teacher, but also his mother's a physicist and his dad's a mathematician and on the faculty at Harvard. So, he started as a high schooler in Jack Strominger's lab. Mm. So, before he even started as a undergrad at Harvard, he'd already published with Jack Strominger. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So, he continued to do research as an undergrad and then um, got 
more serious immunology, additional um, immunology training as a PhD student. And then for his postdoc, wanted to um, really delve into the connection between the immune system and the um, nervous system. So that's uh, launched this project. But Isaac um, is going to be I hope, moving even closer into the microbial pathogenesis field. Um, he's recently accepted a tenure-track position in the Department of Microbiology and Immunobiology at Harvard Medical School, so John Michelanos' um, department, mm. where he plans to pursue this fascinating work. Wow. Yeah. I predict we will hear from Isaac in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. He also gave a lot of credit to uh, Clifford Wolf, his um, mentor, who mm -hmm. encourages people to come in and, and really follow their ideas and then help them develop the collaborations they need. And um, as as uh, Michael was pointing out, the staff community was really um, helpful. So Alex Horswell contributed some fluorescently tagged staff strains um, for Isaac to use in these experiments. And he also gave a lot of credit to Julie Wardenberg, who's um, been studying the toxin, the alpha homolysin, um, that was instrumental in this work. So, so Michelle, there's an author on this named Amanda Strominger. Yes. Related? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Anyway, congratulations to the authors. It's a really nice story. Thank you, Michelle. Yep. All right. Let's um, just read a few emails here. The first one is from Francois, who uh, I believe is French, as you can probably tell by his writing. Hello, Twim team. After reading the Pasteur lecture, it seems that the idea of using Pseudomonas aeruginosa, coal and septicemia, came from a demonstration that the bactericide in the blood from an animal with an anthrax, sans charbonneau, was the only origin of the disease. It was a point of contention in the fight against the last supporters of the spontaneous generation. When using the sang charbonneau from dead animals collected at a rendering facility was shown to kill a rabbit, but without the presence of the bactericide in the rabbit blood. Pasteur was able to demonstrate that was due to contamination of the core blood between the time of death and the collection by the, quote, virions, unquote, causing septicemia. Hmm. And that's what that was causing the destruction of the coal virulence, virulence charbonneuse. For him, it was of therapeutic interest, but it seems he has never used it on humans, only on guinea pigs. So he read it in the original, he read Pasteur's article in the original French. Right. Okay. Got it. Uh, did we uh, mention this at some point in the past? Yeah, we did. We mentioned it on the show. It, Elio brought it up uh, about Pasteur, and uh, it was in the paper's references that they referenced Pasteur's uh, work. Okay. Okay. He has developed instead the vaccination against anthrax by selection of an attenuated variant. By the way, fun coincidence with Michael remarking to Elio about the LON and E. coli turning to snakes. I don't remember that. Do you remember that, Michael? Mm, we were talking about uh, when you knock out the... I, I got to remember the snake story. Uh, I think it was <laughs> when we were talking about um, the DNA G mutation or one of the DNA mutations that causes them to snake. Okay. I'm glad people listen, though. Yeah. <laughs> in the same lecture, Pasteur also observed that outside of the blood in septicemia killed guinea pigs, the bactericides form long snake-like filaments, creeping, sinuous, and separating the blood cells as a snake separates the grass in the bushes. On Ooh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a quote. Wow. <laughs> it's very nice. Thank you, Francois. Très bon. Velma writes, Sp Speleosalutations Twimologists. I have never been as excited about a podcast as I was when I saw the title of the latest episode of TWIM 51, well, that's quite a while ago, Cave Science with Hazel Barton, and it definitely did not disappoint. I listened to it twice right away. I'm trying to specialize in metagenomics, and I love caves and caving. If someone had asked me to design my dream TWIM, it would have been exactly like this. <laughs> I had actually thought about suggesting the antibiotic resistance in cave microbes paper for discussion, but I didn't think anyone else would find it interesting. Probably because... We had that in Small Things Considered. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and look it up. 
probably because I come from a country with no proper caves where you only get blank stares when you mention caving. Thank you so much for this episode. <laughs> I also have a question. There's an article in the yes. Current or a New Yorker of a couple of weeks ago on caving. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. It's a whole world out there. No oh, yeah. idea it oh, was yeah. that sophisticated. I also have a question. Dr. Barton mentioned that they've tried to do 454 sequencing, but apparently they haven't published anything about that yet. Do you know, do any of you know of any sequencing based cave microbiome papers? particularly about normal karst caves. I've been unable uh, to find something. it. I'm sorry to say, I, I don't remember, I can't put my finger on it, but I saw something recently. Thank yeah, you once something. more for the most awesome podcast episode ever, Velma, your subway driving fan from <laughs> Finland. Subway driving. Ah, there are no caves in Finland. Apparently not. My goodness. I, so I sent an email to Hazel Barton and I asked her. And so she wrote back, yeah, unfortunately we've done a ton, but the papers aren't done. Here are some good references though. So she sent two papers. One is making a living while starving in the dark. Metagenomic insights into the energy dynamics of a carbonate cave. And life in the dark. Metagenomic evidence that a microbial slime community is driven by inorganic nitrogen metabolism. All right, thank you, Hazel. I'm um, yes for responding. And they're both in the ISME journal in 2013. Mm. Mm. What does that stand for? International something or other. <laughs> Society of Microbial, microbial Ecology. Energy. I think it's Ecology. the last two are microbial ecology. Yeah, microbial Science. ecology. All right, thank you. Yeah, there's also. <laughs> That's correct, microbial ecology. There's also International Society for Music Education. <laughs> <laughs> Less interested in Kate. I don't That's think right. Hazel's published there. I don't think or so. Or the other authors have published there. Pete writes, hi, one of the other podcasts I listen to is CBC Radio's Quirks and Quarks. I find it always interesting and often profound. The segment I was just blown away by was this one. So he links to an ep episode of this podcast, which... Uh, is, is dealing with the problem of antibiotic resistance and what are alternatives. They talk about phage therapy and antimicrobial peptides, host defense peptides, and so forth. They put together many of the keywords I have heard from your podcasts and added a new one, host defense peptide. It even made me consider what are biofilms, a term I have heard you use but never thought significant. So mm. as, as something different, would you consider reviewing this radio segment as you do a paper? You could bring into the discussion regular papers that are relevant too. And a final question, what are biofilms and what are their significance? I think we... we the last episode yeah. was biofilms. So we've addressed that question. And biofilms are, are really the the most significant thing when it comes to infections. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a rare event uh, that you have really a planktonic infection. The, the microbes are really setting up complex communities and really, as we just learned, signaling our immune system, talking, uh, talking to us and uh, controlling pain, uh, altering pain. So yeah. uh, that's principally all done in the biofilm state. And they're important in, in the body, but they evolved in the environment um, in response to antibiotics made by predator or competing bacteria. So they're mm -hmm. these attached biofilm communities are communities that have um, kind of a slimy matrix um, over them to protect them and contain them. You can do this experiment at home if you don't clean your shower. Uh, the biofilms will grow, and uh, you'll get red ones, and you'll get black ones, and green ones. You just have to go to a college dorm and inspect their showers, and you can learn all sorts of marvelous things. You know, in, in Helen Barton's episode, she talked about Norm Pace Norm and the Pace. shower curtain. Yeah, he he gave her a shower curtain and said, "Figure out what's on this." <laughs> now she was desperate for a project as a young, starving graduate student. So Norm goes home, steals a shower curtain. Here, work on this. This is great. Uh, thanks for doing what you do, even though I understand twenty five percent of it. Cheers, Pete is from Sydney, Australia, and one more from John. In your latest twim. 72, I heard you wonder out loud why a virus such as polio managed just fine without virulence, with, whereas one such as norovirus seemed to relish it. Might the answer have something to do with the work of Dr. Graham Rock at the University College London, his old friend's hypothesis, 
a reformulated hygiene hypothesis, distinguishes between microbes that inhabited hunter-gatherer hominids before we lived in cities, like hepatitis A and H. pylori, which protect against allergies, asthma, autoimmune diseases, and those more recently evolved to infect humans living in sufficient population densities to support epidemics like measles, which does not protect against AAA, allergies, asthma, and autoimmune diseases. Maybe virulence evolved as an adaptation to crowds. That's possible. It could be that norovirus is a more recently introduced pathogen, and that's that could be why that it's more virulent. Maybe it hasn't evolved yet uh, to coexist peacefully with its host. It's an interesting thought. P.S. My mother's family has the same has the name Ian Yellow, I A N I E L L O, which means uh. maybe five hundred years ago or so, our families may have known each other. Just another thought. <laughs> Phyl- mm. Phylogenetic trees of the rack and yellows. <laughs> Maybe. We'll have to sequence our genome. Mm. Mm. I right. think we're probably all related if we sequen our, sequence our genome. I don't think we've gotten to the point where sequencing is that fine structure yet. Well, actually, I did this 23andMe um, analysis on my whole family. Oh. And you can see, so there are markers for different origins, you know, and I have... You can see um, I have origins from the Middle East that I didn't know I had. Like 20% of me came from somewhere in the Middle East. So you can do some pretty granular analysis. Just And this is just with, you know, some SNPs, uh, not the even whole genome sequencing. So, And was this your immediate family or you went back to um, aunts, uncles? Just my immediate family, yeah. Aunts, uncles would be cool. That would be really... And, you know, the thing is that's interesting. Uh, you put your results in uh, 23andMe, and then if you want, you can open it up. And then you get people, like, who contact you, and they're your relatives. And you didn't even know <laughs> that you had these people. I had a guy contact me from the UK who's clearly related. His mother was born in the town in Italy where my father came from. And, you know, he's he, there's no doubt that, that they're related. And he found me through this DNA analysis. So I find, that, I find that really I cool. I got to tell you what happened to me once. I met a lady from Russia who had the same last name as me. And I asked her, I said aloud, you suppose we're relatives? And she says, are you rich? <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> you said, no, you're a scientist. So you you want to be careful there. <laughs> That's funny. It's really funny. <laughs> and I just find it compelling to find your relatives. I don't know why. I think there's something about humans that like to know sure. where they came from, right? Sure. Our clan gene. That's right. So, TWIM number 77. You'll find this at iTunes and also at microworld.org slash TWIM. If you like what we do, we like you to go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating there. And that helps to keep us visible so more people can find us. And we do love getting your questions and comments. You can send them to twim at twiv.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. Till next time. Alio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. My pleasure, of course. And Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks all. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 